I call that the first one? Any ideas? Right, so the lowest one is going to be the first one to lose the proton because that's the strongest acid. I call it the first one for that reason. So you'll notice that this pKa refers to the difference between two protons on and one proton on. We can think of this one as HA. We can think of this one as A minus. However, when we look at the second one, this one becomes HA and this one becomes A minus. So when we have multiple things that have protons, what's HA and what's A minus varies with which ionization we are talking about. Okay. Now, if I'm talking about a solution that is at approximately pH 1, I'm talking about probably these two molecules right here because one is much closer to that than it is to 4.19. And I'll show you how this goes later, but I'm just sort of introducing this to you right now. Okay? Well, what we find is that many, many molecules have multiple groups that can gain and lose protons. Amino acids, which we'll be talking about next, have that very property. Every amino acid has the ability to gain and lose at least two protons. Every amino acid has the ability to gain and lose at least two protons. Some can gain and lose three. Okay. Now, I'm not going to go through the details of that right now. I'll actually save that for the lecture on Friday. I want to keep it simple today. So what I'm going to talk about today are solutions that only can gain and lose one proton. Okay. But keep in mind that there are molecules, and we'll be talking about them later, that can gain and lose more than one proton. I might introduce it just a little bit today. All right, like a citric acid, it can do three. Phosphoric acid can do three, okay? All right, let's see. I told you earlier that we have to worry about our enzymes because our enzymes have their charges and their shapes changed as a result of a change in pH. Here's a plot that shows the amount of activity, that is how functional an enzyme is, on the y-axis. So high values mean very functional, low values mean very non-functional, as, as it relates to the pH of the solution it's in. Okay? Most enzymes have an optimum around pH 7. But some enzymes, look at this guy right here, its optimum activity is at about pH 2. If I raise this guy to pH 7, it's not very active at all. Anybody have any idea why that's the case for this enzyme? It's in your stomach. okay? And so that enzyme has evolved in my stomach. That enzyme has, is in a situation where it darn sure better be able to work at a low pH because that's the pH of my stomach. Most enzymes don't have that property. If I took this guy over here, lysozyme, which you can find in your tears, for example, if I took lysozyme to pH 2, it's not going to be very active. I don't want to pour any pH 2 stuff in my eyes to find that out. Okay, I'm sure you wouldn't want to find this either. But this does illustrate for us how activity changes with pH. It tells us the importance of trying to maintain a certain pH because if we don't, we destroy the function of our enzyme. If I were to take and screw up the pH of my stomach, my pepsin would not work either. Okay. So now, how many people when you're in general chemistry had to do titrations? How many people like doing titrations? A very small percentage. I hated those damn things too. Okay. And you had to spend drop by drop by drop, and the pH doesn't change, and oh my god, I'm going to be here forever, and oh my god, there's a baseball game out there I want to go to, and blah, 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 right? You know the feeling, right? That's what happens when you do a titration. The reason that that happens is because you're titrating typically a buffer. And the buffer is resisting at a certain point that change in pH, that change of proton concentration that you're adding. Okay. 
Well, let's look simply, and actually let me get a little bit better one here for you. There's a better one on here. Okay. Let's first of all think about what the buffer is doing, then we'll titrate it. All right. This is a very, very good illustration of what a buffer can do. And there's a problem or two in the practice problems that I gave you where you'll see exactly this phenomenon happening. If I take a solution of water, pure water, nothing in it but water, and I add to it one milliliter of 0.1 molar HCl, okay, and I think this was uh, probably about 100 mils here if I recall correctly, what happens is the pH goes from 7, which is that of pure water, down to pH 3 by adding one milliliter of 0.1 molar HCl. I've added protons, there's no buffer. Pure water is not a buffer, there's no buffer there. So whatever protons I add, that's what I've got. If I have a buffer, remember the buffer is able to absorb some of those protons, and if I have a buffer that is in the right pH range, when I add that same amount, the pH goes from 7 to 6.9. The buffer has resisted that change in pH, and I'm set. The same thing happens if I add sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide takes away protons. So instead of having pH 7, it goes up to pH 11. The buffer, it goes from pH 7 to pH 7.1. The buffer has resisted that change in the concentration of the protons. In this case, something taking away the protons. Well, if something is taking away the protons, how does the buffer resist that? How does the buffer resist the loss of protons? I haven't said that one. I've talked about how it can donate protons, or how it can absorb protons. The answer is I just gave it away. I just said what it's got to do is it, it's able to donate protons. What the buffer has the capacity to do is either to absorb, pro absorb protons or donate protons as necessary. And that's the magic of the buffer the ability to donate or absorb protons as necessary. That is what the titration curve is designed to teach you. Okay? Here's the titration curve. This titration doesn't use acetic acid. It uses a phosphate solution. The phosphate solution, okay, there's one of the molecules in the solution. There's the other molecule in the solution. Which one's the salt and which one's the acid? Acid's on the left. Why? It's got the most protons. There's your acid. There's the same molecule, except it's missing a proton. That must be the salt. Right? OK. Now, this guy right here has um, the difference between these two is a pKa of 7.2. I'm going to explain to you in, in other terms in a minute what that means. But for the moment, I want you just to, to, to uh, accept from me that this pKa is 7.2. It's a constant. It's a constant for this particular, uh, these particular forms of the acid. OK? What I've got is a solution like you had in general chemistry, where I've got a beaker that's got some of this material in it. And when I started the reaction, I had everything in this form. I had everything in the H2PO4 form. What did that tell you about the pH relative to the pKa? If I had everything in the acid form and nothing in the salt form, is the pH lower or higher than the pKa? It has to be lower, right? Because that log term has to be negative. Right? Which means that the pH is going to be lower than the pKa. Well, this graph says, look, it's lower than the pKa. The graph is consistent with what I just told you. Right? On the other hand, if I had everything present in this form, we see the pH is higher. That tells us that we have to have more salt than acid. Right? Make sense? People are grudgingly saying, yes, I see. OK, it's sort of making sense. OK. Now, well, how do I go from here to here? Well, in the, in the experiment that you're doing in the general chemistry lab, you're probably, if you're starting down here, you must be adding a strong base to it because you're taking away protons. Right? To raise that pH, you've got to raise, you, you got to take away protons. So you're adding a strong base, and each drop of base, of strong base that you add, 
causes that pH to rise, 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 rise a little bit. Look what happens as it starts rising. At first it rises very rapidly, and then it sort of flattens out. Now, I find that students are very good at recognizing flattening out, but not very good at telling me what flattening out means. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to quiz you. I'm going to tell you what the flattening out means. The flattening out means that the pH is going up very slowly as I'm adding the same amount each time of more strong base. The pH is not moving as much as it was over here. When I went from here to here, which might be one drop, okay? So if I go each step one drop, from here to here, I go from here up to about right here. The next drop goes from here to here, it doesn't go up as much. Next drop doesn't go up as much. Next drop doesn't go up as much. Next drop. And finally I get over here and it starts going up faster and faster and faster and faster. You with me on that? There's a magical place here called the inflection point. And the inflection point is magical because it's at this point we have equal amounts of salt and acid. Equal amounts of salt and acid. And if I have equal amounts of salt and acid, based on the henderson hasselbalch equation, what can I say about the pH and the pKa? They are the same. Because the log term, the ratio is 1. The log of 1 is equal to 0. And when the log term is 0, pH equals pKa. Notice, I said the pKa was 7.2. That also happens to be the pH at this point. I am set. Now, notice that the inflection point is where this guy is rising the slowest. The slowest rate of increase is happening right here. What that tells me is that for this solution, the maximum ability to absorb or give off protons occurs when pH equals pKa. I'll repeat that. The maximum ability of this solution to absorb or give off protons occurs when pH equals pKa. That's a mouthful of way of saying that. I like to say that the maximum buffering capacity happens when pH equals pKa. The maximum buffering capacity occurs when pH equals pKa. Remember that. Now, that's a lot of material. It's kind of dense. Questions on that? You think you could interpret a curve like I just did? A few say yes. A lot of squinting. No questions? Well, to kind of help you with this, I actually created a little bit of a study guide. I'd like to work with you, and I'll, I'll need your assistance with me on this, okay? So um, please join me um, in this, if you would. Biochemistry, biochemistry, I wish that I were wiser. <laughs> I feel I'm in way or my head. I need a new advisor. My courses really shouldn't be, come on, such metabolic misery. Biochemistry, biochemistry, I wish that I were wiser. Biochemistry, biochemistry, reactions make me shiver. You can sing along with me. They're in my heart and in my lungs. They're even in my liver. I promise I would not complain if I could store them in my brain. Biochemistry, biochemistry, I wish that I were wiser. Biochemistry, biochemistry, I'm truly in a...